Okay, welcome to uh, the final events of this year's symposium. Um, this is the second of our composer forums in which we hear from the selected composers. Um, we hear about their, uh, their pieces and how they were composed um, and the aesthetic background to the pieces. Today we have Sam Cave and Faz and Salsabili's pieces. Um, and so we have Sam with us. Uh, unfortunately, Farzan is unable to be with us because of the current situation with the internet in Iran. Um, but I, he sent me some material, so I will be sharing that with everyone um, today. Um, so we, we're going to start with Sam's piece. And... Um, In this year's symposium, Sam Cave, um, Sam Cave's piece for string quartet, but their stillness showed plainly, was selected by the academic committee, um, and um, we are going to start by listening to the whole piece, and then um, afterwards, uh, Sam will um, talk to us about the piece. Okay.
Okay, thank you, Sam. Um, would you like to um, to start presenting on your piece? Yes. 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 Let's 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 see whether the uh, solution yeah. works. Okay. Well. Ah, yes. There we are. Yes, there we are. All right. Welcome to Sam, um, and welcome to TTN. Who's as well. Great. Hang on. Right, so let's just swap that over. Okay, lovely. So now then, if I just start presenting this window here, let's see how well that goes. Marvellous, that looks good. Okay, great. Well, uh, thank you very much, uh, George, for playing uh, that piece in its entirety. I think it's quite rare, actually, to play uh the entirety of a piece that one's going to talk about at these uh symposiums and um because of that uh i'm not going to give uh, a blow by blow account of what happens uh, during the entire piece um simply because we've already heard how it sort of sits how it, how it fits together on the large scale but what i am going to do is talk quite a lot about the background uh, to the materials that this piece is built from and show some of the ways in which they're deployed uh, in the piece and talk about some more general uh, some more general trends um, in uh, my music at the time that this piece was composed and uh, try to um, show how this piece reflects those concerns. Uh, so the first thing to say is that um, this piece was originally uh, written for a slightly different uh, quartet makeup. Uh, this piece was written in 2017, the, the first version of this piece, for a, a new music group in the UK called Distract Fold. And their lineup is clarinet, and in the case of my piece it was clarinet in B-flat with violin, uh, viola and cello. And um, I think actually that I I slightly made an error in this first version uh, because when I came to rearrange it uh, and turn it into a string quartet the following year, I realized something, which was that in uh, the original um, quartet, the strings worked together and the clarinet, because it's sort of the odd one out, functioned as a uh, like, a, like a blender or a, or a, um, uh, a go-between, a mediator between the uh, different kinds of harmonic material, the different kinds of pitch material particularly, uh, and particularly the discrepancies between the equally tempered pitches and the microtonal pitches. Um, it functioned as a mediator, a sort of go-between between, between those different harmonic worlds. And, and it was quite successful, but actually I think that piece could have been uh, even more successful with the version with clarinet, if the clarinet had had some material that the others didn't in a sort of Burt Whistlian uh, way, like in his Five Distances for Wind Quintet, where the horn, being the odd one out, has material that nobody else ever has. And I think I slightly missed a trick when I wrote the first version of this piece. And so I was very happy when I got the opportunity to make it into a string quartet, because I think it's a better string quartet than it was uh, another piece. And actually, when we did the recording, um, my PhD, so I wrote this as part of my PhD portfolio, and my supervisor, Christopher Fox, was there, and uh, he said, um, well done. He said, I think you've written a string quartet by a strange route by writing a piece that wasn't for string quartet first, but actually it is a string quartet, and I think it's much more successful that for being so. Uh, this, Expressively speaking, uh, this piece is concerned with the, the sort of big ideas of what I was exploring at, at the time, and still am to a certain extent, although in different ways. And I suppose you could um, sum them up with these sort of four statements. Um, and what I'm going to try to do in this talk is to show some of the technical background uh, quite extensively, I suppose, but also continuously or continually uh, link back to these expressive aims of these ideals or these ideas uh, and try to show in what way the technical content of the music or the technical resources of the music are linked to the expressive territory that the music is at least attempting to inhabit. Um, I think it's very easy to get um, I really love talking about technical details of compositions and how they work but uh, I think it's important to always bring them back to some sort of expressive effect uh, and how that manifests in the music. 
So, uh, like lots of my pieces, uh, this piece is really born out of an obsession with um, church bells, church bells that are that are constructed and tuned in the English change ringing style. And uh, the, the very beginnings of this piece came about when uh, I was leafing through my book called Dove's Guide, which is a database of um, church bells. Uh, and I discovered that in Knightsbridge, uh, there's this little uh, church which has a, a ring of three bells, three church bells. And normally church bells uh, in the UK, in the English style, they make a scale. They, they, they run down a scale in steps. But these ones are a bit strange because they're a conglomeration of uh, interval skips, of, of jumps, uh, being uh, bells eight, four and one of what should be a ring of eight. And uh, bell numbers are numbered the opposite way around to musical scales. So uh, bell eight has the lowest note in this case, and one is the highest note. So it's slightly upside down. Uh, I hope that um, I don't confuse myself or anybody else by talking about things being upside down. But um, this is an interesting um, set of, uh, of, of pitches. And so I decided to do something with these. Uh, and um, because, and what I did was uh, took each one of these bell notes and I transposed them onto C. They're in E flat in this church, but I transposed them onto C because I had a cello and the lowest C string of the cello. Uh, I wanted to be the fundamental pitch of the of, of the ensemble. It is the fundamental pitch of the ensemble. So in terms of register, at least. And so um, uh, I decided to transpose this onto C. And I came up with the idea of uh, assigning each one of these really important notes uh, to an instrument. Uh, and you can see them laid out there, uh, the low C being given to the cello uh, and this G, the dominant pitch, uh, being bell four or the fifth degree of the scale, if you count in music way from the bass up, uh, being given to the viola and the high C, the octave tonic being given to the violin. And uh, the tuning of church bells is a very important part of my uh, loves, my, my musical preoccupations but there was no tuning data available for these notes so um, I, I, I turned to a ring of bells that I know the tuning on very well and have some detailed analyses of uh, to give um, the scent deviations of uh, the corresponding bells to the ensemble. So um, the scent deviations that are shown in this diagram were taken from a ring of bells from a church in Westminster, St. Stephen's in Rochester Row, where they have this very interesting stretched octave where the, the, the highest pitch um, is uh, 50 cents sharp and the, the, the fifth is uh, a slightly uh, flattened fifth being 20 cents flat. And what is it, uh, you know, what do I like about these things? Well, uh, some of the things that I like about these are summed up in this statement that um, the, this sort of stretched octave, and in fact, a little bit, this flat fifth uh, has, or slightly flat fifth, give have a sort of stable fragility about them uh they uh are somehow wanting to um resolve very much if they're in close position but if they're far apart in register they can sound quite stable they have a sort of well i said it a, a fragile stability about them which which i was extremely interested in uh during the composition of this piece and so this uh, tuning, the pitches, the bell pitches in this way, gave me some scordatura uh, ideas or ways to tune the instruments. The cello I left alone because it has the lowest C, which has no scent deviation. Uh, the G uh, I gave to the viola uh, and the high C, the octave um, tonic, I gave to the violin and made appropriate adjustments to the tunings in that way. And uh, it's interesting when I was um, chatting with uh, George. We did a test call the other day for this, and uh, he was talking about how, um, especially in the time that I wrote this piece, I was very interested in getting lots and lots out of very few pitches. Um, and uh, that's definitely true and something that I'm still interested in. But um, I thought that for 10 minutes, I thought that only having three notes available was probably not uh, or probably not enough. And so I thought, oh, well, I need to, to expand the harmonic space. And uh, one of the things that I do to produce um, collections of pitches uh, or harmonic collections of pitches is uh, to think about how church bells are tuned when they're tuned in the English style. And when we hear a, a, a church bell that's been tuned in this way, sound a note, what we're really hearing is not one note. Our, our ear infers one main note. 
but what we're really hearing is a chord. We're really hearing uh, a cloud of partials or, or you know, multiphonics of um, the nodes that are contained within the bell. And these uh, overtones, these partials that bells produce, are really fascinating because they don't conform to the natural overtone series as we would think of it as composers. The natural overtone series that exists on uh, strings or columns of air, like in brass instruments, uh, have a very, very simple structure. Uh, if anybody came to my talk about Christian string quartet last week, uh, I outlined it in quite a lot of detail. But really what's happening in that harmonic series is that um, the notes are vibrating in simple ratios. The fifth partial vibrates once, every, uh, five times every time the fundamental vibrates once. Uh, that's another way of saying that its frequency is five times that of the fundamental. But in church bells, uh, the nodes are, uh, vibrate at much more complex ratios. Uh, and uh, their structure, because you're casting a big lump of molten metal and you tune these things on a giant lathe by scraping bits of metal out of the inside of the bell, uh, the um, higher partials in particular uh, are a lot more varied and they don't conform to this overtone series. They basically play a minor chord, a minor triad within one octave, which is uh, extraordinary for the minor third to be produced so low in an overtone series. Anyway, um, this... Uh, knocking together of spectral resources in the overtone series of strings, uh, in strings in this case, of this piece, and the overtone series of bells is a very important part of my harmonic language. And so the partial of the relevant bells, or the partials of the relevant bells, uh, were used to define uh, three important harmonic areas, one for each bell. And here is a diagram from when I composed the first uh, version of this piece. So if you see clarinet, read violin. Uh, for this deployment um, scheme. Uh, and th these are the three harmonic areas. You can see the bell notes are the ones that are uh, sent adjusted in uh, chord one and chord four. And in chord eight, it's the low C of the cello, the lowest uh, cello string. And these are the three main harmonic areas of the piece uh, as uh, defined by these overtone partials of these bells. These are the things that I like about these four chords that I've that I constructed, or these four harmonic areas, uh, out of um, the uh, materials that I had collected together, and uh, bringing these back to those um, expressive aims that I outlined at the beginning, can see some important things, uh, and mainly, uh, or two of the most important things anyway. Uh, I just want to point out that in chord one and four, the the, the bell note, the, the really important pitch. Uh, that is um, belonging to that chord is not on the bottom. They're, they're not being. They're not fundamentals in the in the way that we think of the bass in music being the fundamental. And that's a characteristic of bells that the the pitch that we ascribe to hearing them uh, sometimes isn't even present in the bell. But it isn't always the lowest note that the bell sounds. And when you do this in music, I find that it gives a certain sort of weightlessness. If you have the uh, like having an inverted chord all the time, where the tonic is actually is, is not on is not in the base of the pitch space, uh, whereas the the third chord, the the chord eight, has its fundamental pitch as the bottom of the register, and so that is a more grounded, a less weightless uh, uh, um, harmonic situation. And then uh, some slightly um, more detailed things. The, the two pitch uh, collections for chord one and chord four are enclosed within a minor ninth. Uh, there's a minor ninth formed between the lowest note and the highest note. And that contributes to this same sort of stretched octave feeling that uh, the bells themselves have um, that I talked about earlier. This sort of slightly fragile stability uh, of, the, of the minor ninth. And the last one doesn't have that. It's, it, again, it's, it's a more um, grounded uh, sonority. Okay, so there are some, some, there are some pitch materials, uh, but now uh, something about some structural materials. Um, the sound of bells is very important in my music, but also um, uh, the tunes that bells play. They're not really tunes, they're called methods. And uh, what they are is a series of number permutations. And they have uh, very interesting structures, these number permutation sets that are called methods, because they link together permutations in an order that visits each permutation once and only once before looping back to the beginning. And what I've written out here uh, in, is uh, a sequence that's called plain hunt. And uh, this links together all six possible permutations of three things. 
uh, three factorial, if anybody enjoys maths, three factorial, three times two times one, gives you the number of permutations that are available with three things, and three times two times one is six. And this sequence of uh, those rows, one, two, three, two, one, three, two, three, one, and so on, link together all six of these possible permutations once and only once. And so, uh, one thing that I uh, often do is use some system, some bell ringing method to give structure to what's going on. And in the case of this piece, uh, I used plain hunt. It seemed obvious to do that because I have three harmonic areas and this uh, gives all the possible permutations of those three areas. Um, when I was composing the drafts of this piece, uh, I did one section. I think I did the ending first. Anyway, and what it came out so long, I had a 10 minute time limit for this piece, and it came out to be so long uh, when I was pacing the deployment of these pitch materials. You can hear this piece is built out of long notes and lots of drones and things, that I had to modify the structure because it would have been about half an hour if I'd gone through the whole thing. So uh, I slightly modified things, and I, start, and I decided on four sections in the end. And uh, I started with sections A and B and C, follow the principle of plain hunt. And then the last section, section D, jumps back and uh, has the same structure as the first one. So I've missed a bit out of the series. And I like this idea of looping back at the end uh, to um, the beginning, uh, but in a different way. Uh, we're going to see later on uh, how I try to deal with endings, things that loop back but could go on. Uh, and fleshed out, this is the overall structure of the piece uh, as it's deployed in the score and as this is the, the structure from the final uh, final version. And um, what you can sort of see here is uh, uh, that I've waited uh, inside sections B and C, there are sub subsections and uh, I, I've, I've slightly weighted them so that material two uh, is, is more explored in sections B and C than it is in sections A and D. A and D tend to focus on uh, the sonorities from the chord one and chord eight, their harmonic areas one and three. And uh, the bell chord four, uh, which is the one with the G 20 cents flat, is uh, reserved for more thorough exploration in the middle sections of the piece. So there's a sort of slightly weighted structure if you see in the lengths in bars at the bottom can see it's quite heavily weighted towards uh, harmonic area two in sections B and C. All right, so now I'm going to show some of the ways that these end up in the score, and I'm start going to start by showing um, that we're human beings, and I'm going to start by showing that I didn't follow the plan at the beginning, and that uh, plans, you know, I don't know how other people use plans, but I often have plans and then don't do them, or I use them to help me out when I get stuck, or find my way back to something that I think is very important and should come up at a certain time, uh, but I don't always follow them uh, completely rigidly, uh, and in the case of this piece, the, what was really important was the pacing that pitches are introduced or the way that things are introduced, the way things arrive. And what I ended up uh, with at the beginning was um, starting, I think in the first draft, I started somewhere around bar, what is now bar eight on the second line, where you see in red circle a C quarter sharp. That's the, the, the octave tonic bell note in violin one. Uh, but uh, and then uh, I deployed the rest of that first chord, the one that's in red. Uh, that's the first harmonic area from bell chord one. And I thought, oh, this doesn't really work. So I'm going to go back in time. I'm going to see what happens before that. And I ended up with this very special sonority at the beginning, which is a C, which uh, has green and yellow circles because it belongs in harmonic area two and three. Uh, and um, this G, uh, which is a some sort of modification of bell note four. And, uh, which comes from harmonic area two, that's in green, uh, but it's in blue because it's not quite right. It's not its 20 cents flat real self. But uh, that was a question of how to introduce this special pitch. And at the beginning, uh, the deployment of these pitches, this C and this G on the viola is really important and gives a good insight into how I'm trying to create this sort of fragile, weightless st stability, this sort of fragile intensity, because the C is deployed as a very high part, well, not a very high, but a high partial of the cello C string as a natural harmonic. And that high partial has a certain kind of delicacy about it, but also because the string is vibrating in short sections, 
uh, because there are multiple nodes for that harmonic, it has a certain kind of intensity in within it, even though we're not there's no vibrato or anything because it's a natural harmonic. And similar to that, the the the, the G in the uh, blue circle that's in the viola is very very high on the C string, the lowest string of the viola and that has the same sort of effect it's a short string length so there's some sort of intensity about it and yet it's very quiet and 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 it's quite fragile that sound to play that high up on the c string uh, quietly it's quite a fragile sound and so that's an important deployment of those pitches those pitches wouldn't mean very much if they were just put in their easiest most accessible places that would just be an interval but for me the pitch is related to uh, very much the instrumental timbre they're almost the same thing you saw in that diagram earlier that the um the pitches when i showed the harmonic areas had ideas already about where they should live on the instruments and so that's the introductory section and the pacing of how this first bell chord is introduced. The pitch space starts with the C and this G and then is widened up to C quarter sharp at the start of the second line in the violin one and then up to a D in violin one again a little later on. And then we finally get an E added and then uh, the C quarter sharp comes back in violin two and the F on the top. And then we finally at the end of this page got the first uh, bell chord. Uh, if we oh, wrong button. If we look to the next uh, thing, I can show you uh, a transitionary effect. Some of the, if you were eagle-eyed, you will have noticed that the harmonic areas had uh, pitches in common with each other, some of them. So there are sort of wormholes, ways of blending between these harmonic areas. And that was an important part of what I do. Uh, and uh, in this piece, there are no jump cuts. Uh, really this is all done through through blending um and so you can see an example of that here that at the start of this page violin one has a has a red note a, a bell note uh, a bell chord one pitch the c quarter sharp and it glides it down to a c natural and passes that to the viola and the c natural is a pitch that's in the um second harmonic area the green area and so that pitch has been passed from the violin who was in area one to the viola who's uh, in area two now and underneath that we get a new low note this is the lowest note of harmonic area two appearing in the cello and then harmonic area two is built up in a similar way an intuitive sort of pacing through this section and um, so in that way um, things are passed from one instrument to another and that passing uh, has sometimes structural significance in the way that one moves from one harmonic area to the next. Another important feature, this is from much later in the piece, but shows a very important feature that I'm interested in. I, I talked earlier about the pitches derived from bells rubbing up against spectral pitches and equally tempered pitches. And here is a very clear example of that. In these three, what are they, sort of slightly sludgy purple circles, uh, I was running out of colours for this, this diagram. Um, in these three slightly sludgy purple um, circles are three different kinds of F. Uh, there's an F being the seventh partial of the cello's G string, uh, being 31 cents flat. There's an F, <coughs> excuse me, being the seventh partial of the ch of the viola's G string, which is 31 cents flat plus the 20 cents flat that string already is for its bell note. <coughs> and then on the top in first violin, there's an equally tempered F. So there are three, uh, three Fs in play at that point. And similar in this, um, although another slightly sludgy orange circle, there are two different kinds of E. Uh, there's an E being <coughs> the um, uh, octave partial of the violin two's E string. And then there's uh, an E that is the fifth partial of uh, a C uh, on the viola. And, and so that one's 14 cents flat. And <clears throat> so those multiple colorations are an important part of what's going on here. They create beatings against each other, which uh, I find very satisfying. Um, to show another um, aspect of what's going on here uh, and to contribute to this uh, slightly uh, fragile intensity that these beatings create. Sometimes people are asked to tune to a pitch that uh, is appearing in another instrument in another version. So here the first violin uh, in bar 94 is holding an equally tempered F and then it is asked to tune to the F that the cello is playing. Uh, it says sim at the top of the page because it did it on the previous page, but um, it's being asked to tune to the scent deviation of the cello F and then come back up again. 
And then there's another example of that uh, on uh, bar 102, where the first violin is asked to tune down 14 cents to match the E that the viola is playing, uh, has, and it's, it has been playing uh, an equally tempered E. Um, so that's another sort of important part of this uh, landscape and what lends to this sort of intense uh, fragility of what's going on. Here's an example of some of these multiple colorations, again, with their deployments. Uh, this um, shows that the, as I was saying earlier, that when I was working on this piece, the instrumental resource, the tombral resource, is uh, as allied to a decision about pitch uh, as anything else is. Uh, and that has knock-on effects for registral deployment. Some things are only available in certain places. Um, and uh, because of maybe I want them as a harmonic or something, and that means that registrally you haven't got that many options. So it's important to sort of calculate the ramifications of that as you're going along. Finally, I just wanted to say something about the ending. Uh, and I said earlier about um, endings being, I find endings quite hard. Um, I, I quite, uh, I, I, um, I think that I like endings that, that lift away a little bit from what we've been having before and sort of hint at the idea that the piece could continue uh, past what we're hearing. We might be hearing a snapshot of a really long piece. Um, and one way that I like to do that is to hold back some things for the ending. And in the case of this piece, it's the, the third harmonic area getting its right register. So here, at the start of this at letter H, the, the low C of the cello, that's the first time we ever have that. Um, and um, there are other things that contribute to this sort of apotheotic character of the ending. The, the, the fluttering tremolos between open strings and harmonic nodes is reserved for this section. You can see it in the cello in bar 70 and again in 76 in the second violin. And there's a piece of melodic material which is here in violin one, uh, which doesn't exist in the rest of the piece. It comes for the ending. Uh, and then another technique that does that is this pezzicato with the left hand. Uh, in the final uh, moments of the work. And that technique has not been used in the whole piece. Those are the only pizzicato pitches. So it could be the start of something new, but also it's the work settling onto this C fundamental pitch uh, in harmonic area three, the lowest C of the cello, and here reinforced with the lowest C of the viola being one octave apart. And um, so in that way, um, this ending is a closing of a circle, but it also is a hint at perhaps some sort of uh, eternal potential for this piece to continue. Here are some interesting links. If you want to understand more about how church bells work and how they produce their sound, there's a fantastic website there, um, Hibbert's, uh, uh, which contains many, many articles and PhD theses about the sound of bells. Um, and similarly, Dove's Guide is a, is a guide to all the church bells tuned in the English style in the world. And um, that, the final link is the catalogue of my pieces that are published at Bubble Scores. Um, thank you very much indeed for your attention. And congratulations to George for organising such a superb symposium. And uh, it has been a real pleasure to be part of it twice uh, this year. So thank you very much for your attention. And I look forward to any questions that you might have. Thank you very much, Sam. That was a wonderful talk. Um, and there's so much in the piece which I, I wasn't aware of at all. So I've, I've learned so much about the piece and uh, it's given me so many ideas um, and, and things that I want to ask you about. Um, so I, I want to just start by uh, asking something, uh, asking, asking for you to teach teach me and teach us about, and, or maybe repeat it, because I think you, you mentioned it in the talk. What, what does it mean for bells to be tuned in the English style? Is, it, is, it, is there a particular set of um, the harmonics that you mentioned that, as it were, non-natural yes. non overtone series harmonics, which, which define the English style? There, there are, there are very much so. There are five, uh, there are five really important uh, partials um, in uh, a bell that's been tuned, that's been cast. I should first of all say that uh, tuning them is one thing, uh, but um, the way that the shape that the bell is cast in is uh, a very important 
um, consideration for creating its tuning. But yes, bells that are cast in that shape and are um, uh, tuned in this way contain the five most important partials are these ones which I've just put on the screen, I hope I've just put on the screen. Um, there, there are five really important ones. And the interesting thing for us, I suppose, as composers who know about the harmonic series is this um, relationship to the strike pitch column, uh, because um, the um, interest, I suppose, the most interest, they create this sort of minor chord. You have um, an octave uh, below, uh, you have a, a, a prime, uh, you have the minor third, the fifth, and the octave above. And so really they create sort of like minor triads. But um, the interesting thing about it, if we think about our harmonic series, is that they have this minor third term, so low, it's really weird. In the overtone series, as we know it, you don't get a minor third until four octaves and a minor third above the fundamental. Um, so um, this is a sort of strange phenomenon and when you're when you're hearing a bell you're hearing these five pitches in um some uh what's the word different um amounts of amplitude you're hearing these mixed together um, and also and what are called rim partials which are much higher up the series and have really 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 um uh outlandish looking to us uh, relationships to their fundamental and they, they vibrate at really complex ratios but those are the five that are um, consciously tuned uh, in, in, in a bell in this in this way yeah but the highest and, that is, and, and, and that's specific to England yeah England and and uh, a, a sort of um, historical English colonies so these styles of bells exist in England in Canada uh, a little bit in America, Australia, South Africa a little bit, New Zealand a little bit, um, that sort of thing. That's really interesting because that actually strikes a chord with me that the the sound of church bells in the UK is different yeah. um, from other places. and and But I'd never really been conscious of it. But it, it somehow, the sound of, of church bells in, in the UK is so distinctive and definitive of 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 the uk that's right that's right and yeah. it's got to do with that style of tuning which and and the adva the, the advancements that were made on that tuning when with, originally they were tuned by chip tuning where you just knock little bits out of the rim of the bell with a chisel but it's not very accurate and then somebody worked out how you do it with a lathe and they worked out where the nodes are in the bell and you can shaving off metal at these nodal points brings these five main partials into alignment and um, that's what's called Sim simpson tuning where those intervals exist um in or as near as perfect as you can get them to being uh you know an octave apart let's say the octaves uh should be a pure octave you know what we know as a pure octave um a doubling of the frequency uh, those are the, the the main thing you should get but a really really fascinating thing about it uh that i would like to explore in pieces and i haven't done yet is this phenomena of the um strike note because the note that we hear if you were to ascribe a single pitch to a bell when you hear it that pitch isn't necessarily even being sounded by the bell in the octave that you hear it uh, it's a virtual it can be a virtual pitch it can be inferred by the ear and uh if we had time i could show you some diagrams that that sort of show that you know we everybody who hears that there's a blind test actually you should do it on this website there's a test you can listen to a bell and then you listen to a sine wave and you go yeah that's the right note and then you look at the spectral analysis of the bell and you realize that note isn't there it's just not there in that octave <laughs> Well, this is this is probably a little bit out of the scope of today's discussion, but I, I'm, I'm, it's, it's fascinating to think how did that convention become established in the yeah. UK, and what was it about the colour of or the sonority or the tonality of of that way of tuning the bell which attracted people in such a way that it became conventional? Yeah, exactly. And that's, yeah, I mean, that's, that's I probably. A, that's yeah. probably a very deep musicological research, but yeah. but something which I think is more relevant to our composers forum today is: does that sonority exist? Does it, um, 
pervade your language as a composer I, um, sometimes but not not so much in this piece because um when in the harmonic areas that i defined i focused on a lot of the time on the higher partial on the rim partials on on the ones that are not necessarily these fundamental five that i just showed the only harmonic area that that has more focus on those fundamental partials as is the third one the one with the very low cello c because that has some more sort of grounded stability about it but in other pieces yes and particularly this minor third thing has become important since since then having this minor third relationship so low in the in the in the in the spectrum uh has has become more and more important yeah um, but for a long time, I didn't. I shied away from it. I, I'm not afraid to admit that I was a bit nervous about writing minor chords, and so uh, for a long. I, so I. So when I first started getting into this stuff, like you know, ten years ago or whatever, I focused very much on if I could find analyses that had the higher part, the rim partials in them. I would always look at those straight away because they always have a lot more scent deviations and they're a lot wackier and they're a lot more, you know, beating intervals and things like that. And so I would always look to that. But I think now uh, what I'm trying to one of the things that I'm trying to find now is a way of having the fundamental partials exist uh, more in, 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 in my language. Yeah. And the minor third, I think, is an important key to that. The minor third and the fifth, I think. Are important for that but presumably in in reality those even those five um partials the the main partials are not going to be exactly they're not going to be tuned exactly in, no. in the real world are they no so, they're not like, so like, they're like, like that's right like for example in the example i used um of the bells at rochester row where that's where the c quarter sharp comes from because the highest bell there is a quarter tone sharp versus the lowest one so they don't make an octave they make you know not quite a minor ninth yeah um I'm, we we can open open it up to other people if if they if they would like to ask a question if anyone would like to ask a question please put your hand up and you're most welcome and i can uh, assist with any translation work if anyone needs yes george needs... once translated one of my lectures in real time didn't you in tianjin do you remember yeah <laughs> um okay if no uh but but i do have one more question and i think this is one this this one relates to this this is a, a, a an issue that i have a lot these days i think about it a lot and um i find myself wondering this about other composers pieces mm. a lot because you uh, and it's, it relates to that low c when it appears which for you is an important moment in the piece yeah and it, in, a, in a way it initiates the coda it's the start that, that's of, right that's the, the start, start of the, of the last section yeah that's yeah right. and you talk about that the note appearing in the right register at that <laughs> point yeah and and so i i made a note here is that right for you or are we to feel it that way as well yeah, that's interesting. I think when I said right, I think what I should have said was uh, in its the register it was designed to exist in the what I considered to be the purest form of that harmonic area, because the, there's a tracking down of that pitch. That pitch starts in the cello at the very beginning of the piece. Uh, one, one, two, three, four octaves above. Or three octaves above and then it moves down through the and so it arrives on that so that third harmonic area is somehow going through a process of inversion and is and then is then landing on that c at that moment and that's where the you know the, what i decided was that harmonic area that's where that appears in so the right register sort of meant the preordained register i suppose is what i meant is it the right register for it for the for the listener um or can we feel that it's there's something right about it. I mean, is there is the rightness something which you know because you design yeah. the structure, or is it something which can be audible to the listener? And, well, and my feeling is that the answer is yes. I think that it, it is audible to the listener by virtue of the fact that it's a cello playing yes. its lowest note. Yes. Yeah. And, well, that, I think and that's, that's a meaningful right. sonority for us. I think that means something. Yes. Uh, that we can understand. Yes. Um, 
Yes, because yeah. open strings have a certain kind of color and you know the maximum string length and the lowest note on the instrument and the lowest note that you hear in the whole piece. So I think in the case of that C, I would hope that that would very that that would very obviously be the right place. And th but then it comes that's definitely the right note. But then it becomes also a question about time, doesn't it? Because the deployment of those sort of things lives or dies so in music. It lives or dies so much by its relationship with time. Because you know that music exists in time, and if you don't get the pace, you're you're you are prescribing the audience's experience of those things really. Because they can't, if they're looking at a painting, they could look at it for ten minutes, go away, and come back, and then go, "Oh, I've got it! That it's that it's that thing." But in music, they have to get it when you give it, because that's how music works. So. I think that it's also a question of it's in the register, yes. The fact that it's the cello, that yes. The fact that it's the lowest note of the piece, yes. The fact that it's also the first note been transposed down by several octaves, yes. But it's also a question of when. And this question of when and pacing is something that I find really interesting. And I'm never surprised by, I mean, I'm interested by the sort of sounds that the, the harmonies that I like make and what do I like about them, this and that and the other. But what surprises me about music is how it speaks through time, how it, how, how it makes a continuity on a large scale and an impact on a larger time scale. And so that's a really important part of the recipe for whether an audience gets it, whether that's the right note or not, is when they get it, I think. Well, can you say something about the timing of that note then? I'm, I'm fascinated by that. Yes, uh, I, I can. And uh, because um, in uh, that uh, moment, or not in that moment, but in the run up to that moment, we've had um, sort of 30. I'm just looking up the numbers. I weighted it so that there's 30, 34 bars where uh, we've been exploring the harmonic area of um, two, which is the one based on the G, 20 cents flat. And that has a C in it, but it's being used as a, a, a supporting pitch in that area. And so we're sort of hearing that C, we're hearing a C, but it's not been, what did I use the other day? Tonicized. And uh, so it's there, but it's not um, functioning in the foreground, but it becomes the foreground when the cello dives down onto it and there's a buildup, quite an intense buildup, I wonder if I can share um, the thing. Hang on a minute. I wonder if I can share the score. There's quite an intense uh, build up to it. Uh, window. Yes, that one, I think. Let's see. Yep. This is uh, coming up to it. So, what's been happening here is that we have this C established in the top line in the um, in the first violin, and it's staying there the whole time. And this this area shifts from being very much on uh, G and A flat with with C and, and F and these sort of area two notes with C in the top like a drone, like an inverted pedal, and that C comes into the foreground more and more as it's taken up by the violin, the second violin, back to the first violin, into the viola as well. And then the cello gets C's again. And, and it's all becoming C. It's all becoming C, very, very intense on C with uh, lots of crescendos and, and small glissandi and, and vibrato. And then the cello dives down onto this low C. And uh, that's the first that's the first iteration of it. And so I think it's to do with the way that that pitch, if I track it back, it's to do with the way that that pitch comes back again. Like we've had here, uh, this is a C in the middle register, or not quite the right octave, but nearly, and then it disappears again. And now it's all E flats, E flats, E flats, E flats and Fs, and then A flats, and it's building up to uh, a chord that's built out of harmonic area two, a special chord. And then we get the C come here in this, creeping in in the high register again and it's gone away so we've had it in not the lowest register but the one above 
the lowest C that's inside the base stave. Then it goes away and we have some other things. And then it comes back very high again in the violin, but it creeps in in a background sort of way and then comes into the foreground in a short space of time, quite intense, and then drops onto that. And I think it's the pacing of that. That's what I was doing there. Yeah. Yeah, that's great. Yeah, thank you. Um, I think this, uh, just to conclude on, on yeah. this discussion, I think something that really strikes me about your music is that um, it's deceptive the, the, it's deceptive on the page yes and you really need to you really need to hear the music yeah to really um to really get what you're doing and and that's um i think so much music especially contemporary music we, we train ourselves to be able to look at a score and imagine how it sounds and we consider that to be an important skill and it yes. definitely is that really is an important skill and it's um it shows a, a real a, 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 a strength of the inner ear and and all of that the imagine the imaginative ear or whatever yes. um but then at the same time i think there are so many details that you're thinking about which it's easy to miss for example your discussion of the first two notes of the cello and the viola part yeah and there's so much thinking there and 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 it's rooted in your own experience of listening yes and you've really listened attentively to how those notes sound in that particular position played on that particular node yeah that particular instrument in that particular register on that and string so exactly exactly so it's not just about the pitch content at all no it's, um for for you those that note on that particular string at that particular node yes with it is it's not just a c uh, uh you know in the third space on the treble clef no so, so much more than that so much and, more than that yes that's right yeah yeah and the and and i think there's i, I think there's a trend nowadays and I think it's because of um, the the prevalence of com competitions, or because of the way in which composers need to build up their careers, um, or or need to show uh, for themselves um, uh, sort of accolades or mm. achievements. And one of the main ways in which composers prove themselves is through competitions. Yeah, but competitions are so much based on. Of the visual appearance of the score and rely a lot on the internal ear of the jury. Yes, and the impact and that it can make in a very, very quick look. Exactly. The juries don't have so, much time. You know, I've been on juries yeah. and, and I'm sure you have. Yeah. You don't have much yeah. time. No, no. And so, so that really makes that's something that I find so interesting about your music. And I really, really enjoyed listening to the whole piece at the start of the today's forum because. Uh, it was it's quite revelatory, really, to 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 hear that the the piece as it unfolds in during those nine minutes, and to um, and just just to hear you giving so much time to each note and or to every sonority, and in a way it seems a very audacious and confidently written piece actually because of that, because you're not in you're not desperate to prove yourself all the time. No, um, that, and yeah. that's. Yeah, that's really, really striking. It made me think of certain aspects of minimalist minimalism, um, but also, but more than that, actually, um, abstract expressionism and the yes. American radical. Those, those those artists, those visual artists, and and the composers that we talk about being abstract exactly. expressionists are very important to me. Yeah, and it made me think of Feldman. A very uh, Feldman. Um, Feldman was a really important early discovery. When I was, yeah. you know, like late teens or early twenties or something, that was yeah. that was a really important. That was a, that was a, that was as important as discovering Grise and Radulescu. Yeah, yeah, it comes through definitely in the music. Mm. Thank you so much, Sam. Thank uh, you. So very thank much. you to Sam Cave um, that, for that um, revelatory uh, discussion. Really, really um, informative and interesting. Now, it falls to me to share um, um, what I have learned about Farzan Salsabili's piece. Farzan uh, 
is unable to be with us today, but he's prepared some materials which I'm going to share with you. So uh, I, I, we have 23 minutes left if we're going to finish on time. So I'm going to try and st stay to the time schedule. Um, Okay, first I want to share with, with everyone some information about Farzan. Farzan was born in 1998. He is an Iranian acoustic electro, electronic composer and pianist. He started learning composition at the age of, age of 18 uh, under the guidance of Karen Kayani and later on under the supervision of Ashia Samsaminia. Uh, and he has won several international and national competitions including uh, the International Composer Competition, New Music Generation in Kazakhstan, uh, second prize in the 28th Concorso Agosto in Italy, um, and as well as uh, being selected for our symposium in Taiwan. Uh, and he's also winner of the sixth Razor Kururian Electroacoustic Competition and Young Iranian Composer Project in Iran. Um, and I was interested to see that he has had private and group lessons with composers such as Ken Ueno, Joachim Heinz, Don Freund, Razor Valley, uh, and has also attended lectures by Chaya Chernovin, who is a, um, an important figure in the New Complexity School um, and associated with, with, with very much associated with that aesthetic. And that shows through in Farzan's music. Um, as well as uh, these other these other composers, um, and he holds a bachelor's degree in composition and piano performance from the University of Applied Science and Technology in Tehran, uh, in Iran. Um, he has prepared for me um, a presentation about his piece, uh, which I've. Put on the on the website, so um, so everyone is 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 free to go and um, and and look at that, and also to look at the uh, the score of the piece as well. I'll put the link in the chat now. So this is the link to his page on the website, uh, and there's also a link. There's also a page on the website for Sam's piece. Which has the score and the and the recording, so um, so do go and have a look at that as well. So this is Farzan's page. Okay. So um, in in Farzan's presentation, he he talks about various aspects of the piece, including his use of harmonics microtonality, um, certain fractional numbers, which he notes notates on the score, which relate to the position on the string where pizzicatos are to be played. For him, that's a very important detail in the music. Um, and also some details about the structure and also a concept uh, to do with a phoneme, which he uses at one particular point. Um, so he, he, wrote, he writes in his introduction that he, uh, he explains that uh, due to the protests taking place in his country against the regime, unfortunately, uh, he says, we are experiencing massive internet blackouts. Because of that, I was not able to join this online presentation. Therefore, I have decided to prepare this text, explaining the overall ideas and thoughts that shaped my piece along with some analysis of the materials I used to write it. And uh, he says he's deeply sorry for not being able to answer everyone's questions. Um, um, because, uh, because of uh, the time we have today, um, I, I want to make sure that we do hear a recording that he's made. Um, he, he, he made this with uh, some colleagues in Iran and sent it to me a few days ago. Um, uh, and he... He reminds me that it's not it's not a perfect version, um, but I think it gives us an idea of 
um, the sound world he creates. Um, so um, I think because I want to make sure that we hear it, I think I think we should we should hear it straight away. So so let's let's start by hearing this.
Okay, so that's the version by the anonymous performers in Iran. I have no idea um, which which string quartet which string quartet that is, um, but it's uh, it strikes me as an extraordinarily beautiful piece um, with a very interesting sound world um, and an interesting structure. Um, now, uh, it, it's not completely clear how faithful the performance is to the score, but I think in a way that's not the most important thing. And I think Farzan might agree to that as well, that um, uh, the what's important for him is as much to do with the proportioning of the music, the pacing and the sound world as the actual pitch content or the specific details of the rhythms uh, that he's written. Um, just to return to his presentation, um, he points out a few details which I want to share with you. So first, in relation to the harmonics, he distinguishes three different types of harmonics um, uh, in the piece. He states that uh, harmonics, um, he states that harmonics, particularly on string instruments, um, were one of the best solutions for obtaining the fragile, fragile sound that he needed, um, uh, uh, which is interesting because Sam, Sam just spoke also about fragility um, in relation to his music as well. Um, now, the three different types of harmonics are natural harmonics up to the 13th harmonic, uh, which are preponderant in the entire piece. Um, the high harmonics, which would be to be performed near the bridge, um, this type of harmonic produces the most fragile sound of all. Um, so again, interestingly, that this is this is also a technique which Sam uses um, in a very important and effective way in his in his piece. Um, and then finally, artificial harmonics um, and Farzan. Uh, if you look at the score, you'll see that Farzan uses some quite daring uh, artificial harmonics. Um, and I want to share one, I just want to show you one example. Um, most of the piece is actually this very spare overlaying of lots of different long notes, as you'll have heard. Uh, but then you get these bursts of incredible frenetic activity. Um, and it's particularly in these moments that you get these quite extraordinary um, artificial harmonics. Um, I want to see if I can find the one which I have in mind. Um, I think it's nearer the end. For example, uh, an artificial harmonic like this one, um, I don't know if you can see my cursor, if you can't shout. Um, here he's requiring a, um, a fifth harmonic, fifth artificial harmonic uh, with a microtonally altered root. Um, in other places he, he requires even uh, an even even less often heard harmonics, such as this, um, which I believe is a ninth harmonic. Yeah, so he he's requiring a ninth harmonic here uh, on a, a, a microtonally flat D sharp. Um, now this is fantastically difficult to achieve, um, possibly impossible. Uh, I'd be interested to hear anyone, if anyone's listening who's a string player, whether it's possible to find that harmonic in such a short amount of time and make it speak. I think it's a very interesting question. Um, okay, to return to his presentation. The second detail, and, and I've just um, 
raised it briefly is it relates to the microtonality. Um, Farzan writes, since microtonality plays a huge role in the traditional music of my country, Iran, it is one of the fundamental compositional techniques in my music. While performing microtonal pitches is common in the contemporary style of uh, composing for string instruments, the excessive use of microtonal signs and the combination of them with the notated harmonic pitches helped me to obtain more complex sounds. In this piece, all the microtonal indications for both sounding pitches and the artificial harmonic fingerings are to be understood as approximate values. And that's this is this raises a very difficult aesthetic question, really, and an interpretive question. Um, relating to the extent to which the uh, notation functions as a, a psych, um, as a prompt or even as a kind of graphic to be interpreted um, rather than simply a set of instructions about how to realize the sounds which the composer wants. And so the psychological aspects of the, of the notation becomes very important um, in a situation like this. Um, the third point is fractional numbers. Um, and this is a very interesting um, uh, stipulation which he makes on the score, which I've, I've never seen before. Maybe, maybe uh, you, you have. Um, but uh, it was very interesting rehearsing with the quartet here in Taiwan yesterday and hearing the actual difference uh, in timbre, uh, which, which is generated by... The, uh, uh, by this technique. So the fractional numbers um, relate to the pizzicato in the, in the piece, and he will stipulate that particular pizzicati have to be plucked at various fractional positions on the string. So he'll write a uh, one over two, so that's to be plucked at the exactly half, at the, the, the one over two uh, position or distance on the string length um, and a one over six so that's um, one sixth of the string distance away from the bridge um, and uh, he, he seems to be uh, quite clear in requiring these ratios to be performed quite accurately um, Now, the, the reason for this, he, he mentions the reason for this here. As it turns out, the whole piece is based on the combination of harmonic sounds and they're being merged into each other to create unpredict unpredictable sound mo moments, um, which, which seems to be quite a fundamental aspect of the new complexity aesthetic, which I think Farzan is, is really drawing upon here. But the piece also aims to explore inharmonicity in by means of spectral distortion and its effect on pitch perception resulting from peculiarities of regionally distinct string composition and construction. Um, and I think here he's actually talking about the physical properties of the string. Um, this musical discourse specifically focuses on various degrees of inharmonicity that occur when a string is plucked. Um, and then he goes on to explain the, the, the meaning of the fractional numbers. And he states that it is crucial for the performers to pay, pay enough attention to these indications since the spectral value content of each plucked point differs. Now, when I read this, I, I was fascinated to ask him if he was a string player. And uh, we know from his biography that he's, he's, he studied the piano. He isn't a string player, but he did say to me that... Uh, he owns a violin and he uses it to explore possible sounds on the violin. So I think it's fairly clear that he is, he's really heard these sounds himself. He's actually played them himself and, and he, he really knows what sound he wants when he makes these stipulations on the score, uh, rather like um, we were just discussing with Sam's piece. Okay, uh, because of uh, time constraints, I'll try to not spend too long uh, discussing the, uh, the remaining two sections. Section four relates to the structure of the piece. Um, there are nine pitch domains marked by the rehearsal letters A, B through to I, emphasizing polyphonic layers, 
which are to be sustained and overlapped as much as possible. However, the piece can be analysed in two main sections of sound movements. And I think what he means here by sections is materials. So section one or material one is the gradual transition of spectral parameters in long sustained notes. And that is uh, rehearsal marks A, C, F, G and H. Um, and this is on the page, it's very visually distinctive because he uses these horizontal lines rather than using conventional um, durations to notate the, the pitch, the, the durations of the notes. And then material two, uh, the rhythmic sections, which I just showed you examples of, um, rehearsal marks B, D and I. And they are in fact the same harmonic proportions of the first section, this, being writ uh, this time being written in complex rhythms influenced by the new complexity style. This is to introduce inversionally symmetric structures, both in pitch and frequency domains, to create a tension and release motion in the sonic temporal continuum, um, which I, I think uh, I, I think in a way he's talking about quite fundamental aspects of composition in any any style actually the idea of uh, tension and release happening in time through sound is quite a is just quite a fundamental aspect of music uh, but this is his own particular way of achieving that goal um, and then finally this rather unusual concept of the phoneme which appears in the in the final section, um, or, or um, yes, it does. It appears near the end of the piece. So he says, in conclusion, sketches with that one blurry eye engages with the issues of complexities at resonance rate resulting from peculiarities of regional distinct string composition. Um, and again, I think he's referring, when he uses the word composition here, I think he's referring to the, 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 um, the physical composition of the string and, um, and the resonances generated by various, uh, at, at various points on the string. As a consequence of multifarious filtering techniques of bowing, uh, circular bowing and the continuous transition of bowing on the different parts of the instrument, um, the modulation index at resonance rate is proportionally, proportionately inter, interwoven with the temporal contiguity as a means of multi-layered parameters. So this is a very complex sentence. Um, my understanding of what he's doing is he's layering a number of different uh, performing techniques, um, various different means of bowing, uh, and transitions in the placing of the bow on the string, uh, along with um, other, uh, you know, complex um, tran um, transformations happening uh, on every parameter of the music simultaneously. So it's a very parametric uh, approach to to the music, um, and as such, the formal framework is structured through uh, rational relations. Um, also, uh, uh, as as structured through rational relations, also determines the spectral output, which corres correspondingly affects the perceptual cohesion. Um, so, I think what what he means here by perceptual cohesion is that um, we, by composing a piece which is rationally composed, it consists of rational interrelationships between different parameters. Um, the the actual sound result, which we get from the piece, uh, re results in some something which in a cohesion which can be perceived but not necessarily understood, and I and and I think that's an idea which comes from serialism, uh, the idea of uh, a row being the determinative element in a piece, the genetic material of the piece, but not necessarily being perceptible on the musical surface and um and and that's that's what i understand uh farzan to be describing here in his piece um 
Okay, uh, and then finally, the last two sections. Additionally, this pitch content can be modulated through physical interaction between the contact point of the bow on the strings. And the speed of the bow is closely related to the resonance peaks. The resonance peaks are integrated in the sense that they are interrelated components, which are used for designing the phoneme by projecting the principles of spectral modeling synthesis. So um, he introduces this idea of the phoneme model towards the end of the piece. But interestingly, on the score, he doesn't explain what it is. Uh, and he doesn't explain it in the, inst in in the instructions in the score either. So um, when I first saw it, I thought it was a mistake. Uh, but here he explains what he means. To clarify, an example of the phoneme can be seen in the combination of violin two and viola sounds on page 10 of the score, where the phoneme is modeled by analyzing the recorded hissing sound of a praying mantis. So this um, made me see the piece in a whole new light when I read this description, because it made me understand that there's a lot going on behind the um, Constitu constitution or the, the creation of the musical material, which we don't necessarily know, we're not necessarily privy to as listeners. And um, in a very neat kind of in, um, correspondence with Sam Cave's piece, I think uh, people listening to Sam's piece wouldn't necessarily um, be able to understand that, um, there, that the, the pitch material relates to char characteristics of of bells, um, uh, but somehow it it communicates itself through the piece as a as a cohesion, as a kind of logical cohesion, which is perceptible to the audience. Um, and I feel that the same kind of cohesion is very much present in Farzan's piece, in spite of the complexity of the sounds which he's presenting us with. Um, so that's uh, that's everything I want to share in relation to Farzan's piece, um, except that I have one little thing I want to show you, which is that um, which is the rehearsal from yesterday. I uh, just want to show you a one minute extract of the rehearsal, and um, the uh, and I, ju I want just because I, I want to, I want to show you. You know, the work that we're doing on the piece. Um, we're, we're recording Sam's and Farzan's pieces to, uh, the day after tomorrow um, with a group, a uh, wonderful group uh, in, um, in Taiwan, in Taichung, called uh, Strike Accord. Um, and uh, yesterday I had a very rewarding session with them um, where we worked in amazing detail on both pieces, really trying to get every... Uh, notation that the composers put on the page, um, you know, in, you know, uh, to, to make it come through in the in the audible result. Uh, so this this is some work that we were doing on Farzan's piece. Um, uh, apologies for the metronome in the background. Okay, so just to conclude, um, uh, one reason why we, we, we had the metronome going is, uh, and you might have noticed if you're looking at the score, that the metronome is playing 
semiquavers, 16th notes, uh, because Faza has notated such a slow tempo that <laughs> we had to uh, resort to using 16th notes to, um, to, to measure the time in the piece, which generates its own kind of tension and um, psychological concentration. Um, so uh, that's everything I'd like to say about Farzan's piece. So thank you everyone to, for listening to the end, staying with me. Um, we've sl gone slightly over time. Does anyone have any comments or any questions? I just to say, I, th I think it's a fantastic piece. Uh, I think uh, it's it's like a sort of we were talking earlier about combinatorial efforts to combine certain things. Uh, we were talking yesterday about what I'm trying to do at the moment, combining certain things with spectral insights. This is sort of new complexity meets spectralism in some way, and I think it's really exciting. And I think that <clears throat> he's really got the good balance between this hyper detail and a, a larger scale structure that that speaks very directly it's very easy you know on one level this is very easy music to understand because it has two it's it's consisting of two strikingly different materials that are that are more or less juxtaposed that's one that's one structural layer or one level that one can understand this music and then on another level you could look at the next level of the microscope down and look at what those materials are constructed out of in uh, on their own and then even which each individual line is constructed out of on its own and then all of these combinatorial parameters that he, that he was talking about in his presentation i think this inharmonicity plucking is really interesting because it's well known the phenomena of the thickness and tension of a string affecting its its amount of inharmonicity and so i wondered how you know that that, that he must have well, maybe not must have, but he perhaps uh, had a hierarchical chart that he made of the level of inharmonicity depending on the, the, the plucking point. Uh, I've done similar things, but with Colenio having a diagram of where you touch on the string with the bow uh, and, um, and which part of the bow, whether you put half the bow across the string or you just use the tip or you go all the way down towards the frog or something, those all have a great impact on the pitch content if you look at it in an analytical way it's sort of hyper detailed way the pitch content of a of a of a colenio note can be affected by all of those things you know where along the string length you tap and how much of the bow you have overhanging the string and i wonder if he, you know if it's something like that but to do with pizzicato and how do you are there any reference resources which can um which can be reference which can be referred to to find that kind of thing out or do you really just have to pick up a, a string instrument and try it yourself yeah i mean i suspect that he i mean he told you that he he has a violin and that he did a bit of finding out and certainly the 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 little things that i've, I've only done that in one or two pieces but or maybe only one piece but i just got hold of one and, and, and tried um i don't know of any any books that have that have categorized or classicized that those those phenomena i don't know of anything that does that no well that's that's an article that's your next article okay that... right yeah, yeah very good very good <laughs> <laughs> right are there any other questions i see that uh dong laoshu has already left he thanks thanked everyone for such a deep discussion and touching music um and i want to do that as well because i think i think that's this is a good point to wrap it up so it, it was a very deep discussion and the pieces are both very touching. And um, thank you to Sam Cave for a really wonderful presentation. And thank you to Farzan Salsabili in his absence. I hope I did justice to his piece uh, and sh did justice to sharing it with everyone today. Um, they're both extraordinary, wonderful pieces, a lot as are uh, Eating's and Matthew's pieces from last week. So I'm, I'm really pleased with the uh, four pieces that the committee chose for this year's symposium. And um, I hope in the future that there might be an opportun opportunity to uh, have them performed uh, in Taiwan. Um, but that's maybe a, you know, that's a future plan. Um, so thank you again to everyone. And this marks the end of the final 
event of this year's International Symposium of uh, Contemporary Music Research. So thank you very much to everyone. Um, and uh, see you next year. Look out for details of uh, the application process for next year's symposium. So thank you, everyone, and goodbye.